Okay, we're going to be looking at pathogenicity tonight. Okay, um, this is essentially the set of tools that a virus or a pathogenic prokaryote or eukaryote utilizes to produce disease. Okay, it could be a toxin, it could be a method of attachment. Okay, um, it could be a method of fooling the immune system. There are all manners of weapons that can be employed in order to allow an organism to produce disease. Okay? The best strategy for a pathogen is to exploit the host long enough for the pathogen to be able to spread. Okay? And this is one of the reasons why pathogens that kill their hosts in short order tend to be less successful over time. In this section, we'll differentiate between pathogenicity genes and islands, and we'll talk about horizontal gene transfer and pathogen evolution. So, in order to produce disease, what is necessary, right? You have to get into the host, all right, and we call those points of entry portals. Now, these may exist naturally, or they could be created as a result of properties of the pathogen, okay? An example of a natural portal in the human body might be the oral or the nasal cavity, okay, um, the, the anus, um, the urethra, okay. A portal created by a pathogen uh, might be one produced by enzymes that can dissolve the barrier uh, presented by things like the skin and the mucous membranes, okay. Then we have to be able to attach to the host long enough to grow and colonize it. Otherwise, you're going to be flushed out of the system. We have to be able to avoid the immune system either by hiding from it or rendering it ineffective in the event that it encounters um, the immune system. And then it has to produce damage associated with disease into the host. And then it may or may not exit, okay? It generally does exit. Sometimes the portal of exit is the same as the portal of entry, and sometimes they're different, okay? And these virulence factors, these characteristics, are what allow this to take place, okay? Some examples of virulence factors include pili, which basically are pipes that allow either attachment or transfer of genetic material between one organism and another. This happens, for instance, in bacteria. Enzymes that damage the host or prevent detection by the immune system. Proteins that destroy normal cell function. The presence of a capsule, which is protective and can also present what we call an endotoxin on their surface. And enzymes that can inactivate antibiotics. A genomic island is a region of bacterial DNA on the chromosome that has GC content different from the rest of the genome, okay? As well as segments of phage or plasma DNA that mark it as different from the rest of the genome. Now, why would phage or plasma DNA be in there? Um, a property called integration, okay? There are phages they can go into lysogeny, for instance, integrate their genetic material into the prokaryotic DNA, into the chromosome, and often, okay, those chunks of DNA will carry virulence factor genes on them, okay? Same can happen with plasma DNA. You can, on occasion, integrate into the chromosome, okay? Pathogenicity islands are just genomic islands where the virulence factors are detected, okay? And again, what they're looking at here is GC content. In the case of the diagram at the bottom, what you see here is a reduced GC content compared to the rest of the genome, and that can be an indication that the, the characteristics of that chunk of DNA are different from the remaining genetic material, and so probably came from a different source, okay? We'll talk about why pathogens need to hook up to hosts, describe 
various microbial attachment techniques and differentiate type 1 and type 4 pili and talk about biofilms. Okay? An example of an attachment mechanism is adhesin, which is a microbial factor promoting hookup. These include pili and non-pili adhesins. Okay? A type 1 pilus is a hair-like appendage used strictly for attachment. You can see examples in the EM micrograph of E. coli attaching to the surface of um, what appears here to be gut tissue. Okay, um, You can see with the inner and outer membrane right, what the organization of the um, attachment pilus looks like, right? The subunits are going to be generated within the cell. They're going to be um, secreted usually through a, a, a transmembrane protein into the, um, the periplasmic space and then they can be assembled on the outer membrane and this can serve as the hookup, okay? In order for this hookup to be effective, the surface of the host has to be able to form an attachment with the type 1 pilus, okay? And that's why not everybody can be colonized by every pathogen, okay? <coughs> An example would be Helicobacter pylori, which can sometimes colonize the gut lining in the stomach and cause peptic ulcers but in most cases passes through the digestive system without exerting its effects, okay? And having the proper surface for the pathogen to attach to is a matter of your genetics, okay? Type 4 pili are thin and flexible, and they have um, motility associated with them, okay? So they can promote movement, um, but they can also promote attachment, okay? And what you're looking at in the upper right-hand corner is an example of uh, fluorescence microscopy, okay? Uh, you use dyes, fluorescent dyes that are attached to antibodies that recognize these structures in the prokaryote, and then when you hit them with a laser, they glow a particular color, right? So you can see in this um, micrograph, we've got um, antibodies tagged with dyes that recognize the, the, the cell body, right, and antibodies attached to dyes that recognize these type 4 pili, okay. So you can see here some of the non pilus adhesins, right. These are simply proteins that are going to be um, on the outer membrane and they're going to be able to connect to host tissue long enough for the pathogen to grow and form a film, okay? And then from there, it may travel, all right? Or it may remain near the area of initial colonization, okay? Um, host proteins that are going to be latched onto include things like integrins and fibronectins, which are utilized by tissues in the body to aid in the formation of things like epithelial and connective tissue and so these are what we would call ubiquitous okay biofilms are an interesting um, mechanism of pathogenicity because they're made up of multiple bacteria that have division of labor within the community allowing them to not only colonize a surface but to resist attack because of the fact that they are heterogeneous in their composition. Within the environment that they create for themselves, um, there are microenvironments that support uh, the needs of bacteria with, with different biochemical profiles. For instance, there will be environments within the biofilm that support aerobes, some that support anaerobes, and some that support um, those organisms that are facultative. And it, it's thought evolutionarily that the biofilm um, was a precursor 
to the first tissues. Okay, so this is uh, what you're looking at here. Kind of is a, a flashback in evolution when we began to make the transition from single cell to multicellular organisms. So this would be something that occurred before the first tissues um, came on the scene. Okay, remember that a tissue is simply cells with similar characteristics um, and properties that perform a job for the organism that a single cell cannot. Okay, so let's look here next couple of um, insets at uh, a little bit about biofilm formation and how they work. Clean abiotic surfaces immersed in liquid tend to attract and concentrate nutrients, whereas biotic surfaces such as plant or animal tissue can themselves be a source of nutrients for microorganisms. A biofilm is formed when microorganisms attach to and grow on a variety of biotic and abiotic surfaces. The initial attachment is usually reversible and often involves attachment by flagella, fimbriae, or other cell surface structures. This is followed by growth of the microorganism and production of an exopolymer, which makes the attachment irreversible. Growth within the biofilm is not uniform. Channels develop which permit incorporation of fresh nutrients and oxygen. Metabolic activities of microorganisms in a biofilm can create changes in the microenvironment. For example, an oxygen gradient can develop that permits anaerobic metabolism near the interior and aerobic metabolism on the exterior. Nutrient and pH gradients are also produced. In the natural environment, Biofilms often consist of different types of organisms that function together in the cycling of the elements. For example, breakdown of cellulose on the surface of a decaying plant may result in release of glucose and other carbohydrates, which supports the growth of non-cellulose degraders. Carbohydrates are converted to organic acids and methane by anaerobic bacteria, and the methane can then be degraded by aerobic microorganisms. Bacteria were once thought of as unicellular organisms incapable of differentiation or communication. But we now know that many, if not most, bacteria form specialized, surface-attached communities called biofilms. Indeed, within aquatic environments, bacteria are found mainly associated with surfaces. This biofilm is a plaque that forms on the surface of a tooth. Plaque is a mixed species biofilm, but single species biofilms also form in nature. For example, single species biofilms of Pseudomonas aeruginosa can form on the lungs of cystic fibrosis patients. The first stage of biofilm formation occurs when a specific environmental signal triggers unattached planktonic cells to attach to nearby inanimate surfaces by means of flagella, pili, lipopolysaccharides, or other cell surface appendages. The attached cells begin to coat that surface with an organic monolayer of polysaccharides or glycoproteins to which more planktonic cells can attach. As the cells enter into biofilm formation, they no longer maintain their flagella and instead may move along surfaces using a twitching motility that involves the extension and retraction of a specific type of pilus. Ultimately, they stop moving and firmly attach to the surface. As more and more cells bind to the surface and divide, they form microcolonies and can begin to communicate with each other by sending and receiving chemical signals in a process called quorum sensing. These chemical signals are continually made and secreted by individual cells. Once a population reaches a certain number, analogous to an organizational quorum, the chemical signal reaches a specific concentration that the cells can sense. This concentration triggers genetically regulated changes that cause cells to bind tenaciously to the substrate and to each other. Quorum sensing may influence the amount of extracellular matrix produced by the cells. This thick, slimy material consists of polysaccharide polymers, called exopolysaccharides, and entrapped organic and inorganic materials. These exopolysaccharides increase the antibiotic resistance of residents within the biofilm, by limiting antibiotic access to the biofilm center. The chemical signal molecules also stimulate production of some antibiotic resistance mechanisms. As the biofilm matures, the amalgam of adherent bacteria and matrix forms columns and streamers, creating channels through which nutrients flow. 
Although most of the bacteria adhere to the biofilm, some planktonic cells leave for new environments. Here is an image of the lumpy, uneven biofilms created by a mucoid environmental strain of P. aeruginosa. Biofilms allow bacteria to stay where food is plentiful. Why should a microbe travel off to hunt for food when it's already available? Once nutrients become scarce, however, individuals will detach from the community to forage for new sources of nutrients. P. aeruginosa produces an enzyme that can strip away the exopolysaccharides and will resynthesize flagella. Cells leaving the biofilm revert to their flagellated planktonic forms and can swim to new locations where nutrients are more plentiful. A hallmark of infectious diseases in which biofilms play a prominent role is their chronic nature. A biofilm infection may linger for months, years, or even a lifetime. Okay, in this section we'll talk about different cell targets for bacterial toxins, explain the modes of action for a, a selected set of toxins, and differentiate an endo from an exotoxin. Okay, so the first thing that we want to look at is a class of molecules known as superantigens. Antigens are normally processed by antigen-presenting cells and presented to T helper cells on class II MHCs. Only the T helper cells with T cell receptors capable of interacting with the antigen are stimulated to produce cytokines. The activated T helper cell stimulates only B cells that react with the same antigen, thereby limiting the response to the production of antibodies that were presented. Superantigens such as the toxic shock syndrome toxin produced by Staphylococcus aureus are not processed by antigen presenting cells. Instead, they bind directly to the outer portion of an MHC class II antigen on antigen presenting cells and to the outer portion of the T cell receptor of T helper cells. Rather than binding to only the cells specific for that antigen, which represent about 1 in 10,000 T cells, the superantigen binds without antigen specificity to as many as 2% to 20% of the T cells. This results in stimulation of many T helper cells. The result is the release and activity of excessive amounts of interleukin-2, IL-2, and other cytokines that enter the bloodstream instead of only acting locally as they normally do. This leads to symptoms of fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and sometimes shock, with failure of many organ systems, circulation failure, and often death. An example of a bacterial toxin is uh, the AB toxin, where the A subunit is toxic and the B subunit binds the host cell receptors. A lot of B subunits are complexes of five units arranged in the ring, while ADP ribosal transferase is going to inactivate or change the target protein by ribosylation. Okay, basically, uh, ribosylation is the transfer of a, a ribose group to a target molecule. Okay, so you can see here, right, the, the, the mechanism of the toxin, right? This is the B subunit. It exists as um, a series of five monomers that latch together as a pentamer, and then the A subunit is the enzyme that produces the toxicity. Well, what's going to happen here is that um, the active protein on the host is going to end up encountering the ribosal transferase. We're going to move this entire functional group, okay, from this organic side group onto the target protein, and the likelihood is that it's going to be a, an R group that contains nitrogen, okay? It'll release nicotinamide as a byproduct, but now this protein that has this ribosal group latched on to the nitrogen-containing R group, that residue likely resides in the active site of the enzyme, which is going to be the likely target here, and as a result, the enzyme can't function anymore. Okay, um, if it's 
going to attack a structural protein, the addition of this organic group will inhibit things like assembly of polymers from protein monomer subunits. Okay? Sort of like taking a puzzle piece and gluing something to a part of one of the pieces and then it can't fit into the puzzle anymore. Okay? Some more examples, right? Um, we've got staphylotox Staphylococcus alpha toxin, okay, and what it does is it generates um, a hole in a red blood cell and produces hemolysis, which is the rupture of that cell. Um, the objective for the staph is to release the iron from the red blood cell, which it can then utilize in enzymes that support its life processes. The result of this, though, is that we end up producing disease as we rupture these red blood cells and it generates complications in the circulatory system. Okay? Uh, another example, right? Cholera and E. coli labile toxin. Okay? Um, you can see here that villi in the small intestine that absorb nutrients like glucose and electrolytes like sodium and chloride and potassium pass them into the blood. That's their normal function. Okay? The villi are just features of the lining of the small intestine designed to increase its surface area. Crypt cells remove electrolytes and water from the blood and anions such as chloride move into the intestine through specific protein channels which are transmembrane um, and this then allows them to pass into the capillaries and then from there, normally, they're going to head to the liver, okay, which will then deal with them. What will happen with um, these toxins is that they are going to attach, all right, um, to the cells that line the intestine, and they're going to damage their ability to engage in transport, okay, because they are going to compromise the cell membrane of these cells that do the absorption, okay? And the result of this is going to be disturbance in electrolyte levels and um, disruption of GI function, okay? So you can um, have manifestations such as um, diarrhea or constipation, okay, um, and other types of GI upset. So basically the way that the cholera toxin, cholera toxin works is what will happen is that it will bind molecules called gangliosides on the surface of the target. If the cell doesn't have the gangliosides, it will bind to another type of glycan. Um, once this happens, it will um, be endocytosed by the cell. The cholera toxin A1 chain gets released by reduction of a disulfide bridge. The endosome is then moved to the Golgi, where this A1 protein is recognized by the ER. Um, a protein chaperone, um, known as protein disulfide isomerase, causes the A1 chain to unfold and be delivered to the membrane. Here, um, ERO1 triggers the release of the A1 protein by oxidation of the disulfide isomerase complex. As the A1 moves from the ER into the cytoplasm by the SEC61 channel, it refolds and avoids deactivation as a result of ubiquitination. CTA is then free to bind with a human partner protein known as ADP ribosylation factor 6. Binding this drives a change in the shape of CTA1. This exposes the active site, enabling catalytic activity. The CTA1 fragment causes ADP ribosylation of the GS alpha subunit using NAD. The ADP ribosylation causes the GA um, as subunit to lose its catalytic activity. So the GTP hydrolysis um, is... Um, 
basically shut down. This maintains the G alpha subunit in the activated state. This causes increased adenylate cyclase activity and the consecration of, concentration of cyclic AMP inside the cell goes up. Okay. Um, this overactivates uh, protein kinase A, which phosphorylates the uh, cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance re regulator, abbreviated CFTR. It's a chloride channel, and this leads to ATP-mediated efflux of chloride uh, to um, cause water, sodium, potassium, and bicarbonate enter, entering the intestinal lumen. In addition, entry of sodium and the entry of water into the enterocytes is diminished. The combined effects result in rapid fluid loss from the intestine up to 2 liters an hour, leading to dehydration and other factors associated with cholera, including a rice water stool. Okay, So the bottom line, right? you can see here the target, the CFTR chloride channel, what you're doing here is changing where the water goes. Okay, In this case, um, you end up uh, inducing uh, a type of diarrhea, okay, which leads to severe dehydration, the water loss, and that can lead to electrolyte imbalance, and that can cause death. Okay, And it does this essentially by screwing around with this chloride channel by changing the biochemistry inside the target. Okay, um, the same basic target is also what's attacked by this E. coli labile toxin. Okay, and that's why we generate the response, the diarrhea response here. Okay? You can see here some examples. Um, this is anthrax toxin attached to surface. Okay. Anthrax is an often fatal bacterial infection that results when the endospores of the bacteria are introduced into the body from one of three ways. One form of infection is initiated when the endospores enter through a cut or abrasion in the skin. This is known as cutaneous anthrax. Once inside the skin, the endospores migrate to the bloodstream. Another form of infection can result from the introduction of endospores into food which is then consumed. This is known as gastrointestinal anthrax. Inhalation anthrax is the third form of infection and occurs when airborne endospores are inhaled into the body. After a brief journey to the lungs, the endospores enter alveolar sacs where they attach to the tissue of the alveoli. This is where the body initiates an immune response against the anthrax endospores. Immune cells in the body, called macrophage cells, become alert of the endospore's presence and begin to attack by exiting the bloodstream. The immune cells engulf the endospores as foreign bodies and then enter back into the bloodstream where they travel for a brief time. The normal response of macrophage cells is to destroy bacteria allowed to invade the body, then travel to lymph glands where they prepare the immune system for future attack. However, anthrax endospores are not destroyed, but begin to germinate within the macrophage cells until they end their journey within a lymph gland. Once inside the gland, the endospores develop into vegetative bacteria known as bacilli, which are then released from the macrophage. Once released, the bacilli cause damage to the cells of the lymph gland and begin to travel throughout the lymphatic system. During their travel, the anthrax bacteria begin to grow and multiply, infecting surrounding areas where they eventually make their way back into the bloodstream. Also during their travel, the anthrax bacteria emit virulence factors which contain the exotoxins responsible for a condition known as toxemia or blood poisoning. The exotoxins are then released from the bloodstream where they invade neighboring cells. This invasion makes the cells unable to regulate their environment and causes the cells to release water and eventually die. This buildup of water causes a condition known as pulmonary edema, in which a large amount of fluid accumulates in the lungs, resulting in tissue damage and pulmonary complications. For most people, symptoms can occur between 1 and 7 days from exposure to the anthrax bacteria. 
Such symptoms resemble a common cold and may include fever, cough, chills, muscle pain, shortness of breath, and shock. Inhalation anthrax, if not treated, can progress to severe disease and is usually fatal. So basically the toxin portion of the anthrax is an AB toxin. <clears throat> the A part um, and the B part are really two A parts and one B part. The, the toxic part are EF and LF, okay, which are enzymes that damage cellular processes once they're escorted inside by the other toxin component, okay? So essentially what's happening here is that um, one portion of the toxin serves as a Trojan horse to get the rest of the toxin inside, okay? Bottom line, the action of the toxin inside the target cell targets calmodulin-dependent adenylate cyclase, increasing cyclic AMP levels in the cell. That changes water balance and causes signaling pathways inside the cell to be screwed up and impairs macrophage function and the bacteria avoid the immune system as a result. The LF subunit also helps the bacteria avoid the immune system by killing the macrophages. It acts as a zinc dependent endoprotease snipping off the end terminus of an enzyme called nitrogen activated protein kinase kinase or MAPKK for short, and this inhibits the kinase by not allowing them to bind their substrate, and that leads to death of the macrophage by apoptosis. So basically, it dies from the inside out. Okay. Anthrax is an... An endotoxin, by its definition, is physically linked to the pathogen, okay? It's part of the outer membrane of a gram-negative cell wall that includes lipopolysaccharide, results in fever, activation of clotting factors, activation of complement, vasodilation, shock, and death when the endotoxin is released into the blood. So what happens here is that the damage is actually done not by the endotoxin itself, but by the attack of the immune system on the endotoxin. Okay, one of the things that gets released um, when the immune system moves in and attacks this antigen is histamine. Okay, and that's what promotes the the vasodilation and the change in um, in where the tissue fluid goes. Okay, um, the activation of complement results. Um, in the attraction of macrophages and um, also the facilitation of phagocytosis, okay, and can also involve antibodies, right, which essentially attach to the LPS and then anything the LPS is attached to gets destroyed, okay, so if this ends up um, causing the immune system to go on a wild goose chase, okay, then what happens is that you get collateral damage as a result of the release of enzymes in granulocytes as well as um, components in things like cytotoxic T cells that end up hurting healthy tissue, okay. We'll talk about type 2, 3, and 4 secretion systems that export exotoxins and effectors and talk about the relationship between secretion systems and microbial structures. Okay. So we can see here a chart showing you some different secretion systems for bacterial toxins. All right. So these are all going to be exotoxins. All right. um, the secretion type is in the left-hand column and then the features and examples are in the other columns, okay? As an example, okay, let's take um, sec A dependent um, type 1 secretion, E. coli alpha hemolysin um, essentially is 
secreted by the E. coli cell, it then ends up integrating into the membrane of the red blood cell, opening holes in the membrane and causing hemolysis. And that will release hemoglobin into the blood and that will cause all kinds of problems um, not dissimilar to the problems that are produced when people have a, a sickle cell anemia crisis where oddly shaped red blood cells jam in capillary beds and in organs that, that process blood and rupture as a result and that produces blockages in capillaries and the result is that you cut off blood supply to downstream tissues and they die. Okay. Um, other examples, okay, um, you've got uh, down at the bottom there, type 6 secretion, okay, and it's a single effector. Examples include uh, vibrio cholera or cholera toxin, okay, and essentially we already know, right, that cholera toxin is going to interfere with the water balance in the target cell. Um, by screwing up cell signaling and targeting that chloride channel, okay, and the result is cell lysis, and uh, one manifestation is tremendous diarrhea, okay. Type 2 secretion systems have a piston type delivery, okay. You can see the lipopolysaccharide, which is the toxin on the outside, okay. And then you can see the secretion pathway, which is going to be facilitated, again, um, by an uh, hydrolysis of ATP, right? That provides the energy, okay? When we form the polymer, right, we have now the ability to excrete the toxin, okay, out into the environment, okay? There's LPS. And there is more of the secreted toxin coming through the piston, powered by the ATP. Okay, that's how it gets out and causes its effects. Type 3 delivery system is a syringe type system, again powered by ATP. Basically the toxin inside the cell enters a, um, a transmembrane tunnel generated by integral proteins that span both the inner and the outer um, bacterial membrane and the periplasmic space and then what happens is that we inject the toxin directly into the host and it exerts its effects okay where type 4 secretion systems are more like tube delivery okay so let's take a look at some of these different secretion systems. Localization processes exist in all cells and affect where your protein ends up after translation. Placing proteins in different parts of the cell is a common activity in genetic engineering. There are five readily distinguishable compartments in a gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli, defined by the presence of contiguous bilayer membranes that prevent the free exchange of biomolecules. There is the cytoplasm in the innermost compartment where all the central dogma processes and most of metabolism takes place. Then there is the periplasm between the two membranes and the extracellular environment accessible only by secretion. The two membranes also present distinct compartments to the cell where proteins can be inserted. All proteins start their life in the cytoplasm, so the cytoplasm is the default location of a new protein in the absence of other targeting mechanisms. Two pathways exist for periplasmic localization, TAT and SEC. SEC secretion involves a signal sequence, also called a leader sequence or pre-sequence. Often a gene will employ a pre-pro sequence on the end terminus, which is cleaved after transport completes. Pre-pro sequences are typically 18 to 30 amino acids long and contain one or more basic residues near the end terminus and a central 7 amino acid hydrophobic core. If a protein just contains a pre-sequence, it will remain anchored to the membrane after translation. If it has a pre-pro sequence, it will be proteolytically cleaved off, releasing the protein to the periplasm. 
During export, the protein is in an unfolded state and is often secreted coincident with translation. Popular parts for prepro sequences that you'll find in many common expression systems are the Pell B and Omp T leader, leader sequences. The TAT secretion system similarly involves a signal sequence, but it doesn't need to be on the end terminus. It is the sequence S or T, then RR, anything, FLK. During TAT secretion, the protein first folds in the cytoplasm and is subsequently transported. The system will not transport non-folded proteins, which is a useful trick in various assays. Getting a protein to the outer membrane or extracellular environment is more challenging, but possible. Several of the E. coli systems have been examined extensively, including OMP-A, OMP-T, OMP-G, and LAMB-B. The process starts with sex secretion to the periplasm, and then they spontaneously fold and insert themselves into the outer membrane. The most popular strategy for targeting a protein to the outer membrane in prokaryotes is to fuse the protein to another protein that already goes there. Popular fusion-based targeting systems include OMP-A and a structurally dissimilar one called ice nucleation protein. If you want to learn more about what exists in this class, here is a nice list at this URL. In a gram-positive bacterium, there is no second membrane, and thus there are only three vesicular compartments, the cytoplasm, the inner membrane, and the extracellular environment. The same basic set of proteins and localization signals that directed proteins to the periplasm in gram negatives will target a protein for extracellular secretion in a gram positive organism. Thus, secreting proteins is usually much easier to achieve in a gram positive rather than a gram negative bacterium. Industrially, commodity proteins like proteases they put in detergent are usually produced in a gram positive bacillus strain. Various fungi are also good protein secretors used in industry. Targeting proteins for secretion is more challenging in gram-negative bacteria. There are at least six distinguishable types of secretion systems that cluster based on sequence homology and consistent aspects of function. The type 5 and type 2 secretion systems, shown here at left, are sec dependent. This means that proteins being secreted will need to contain a prepro sequence on their end terminus, and the first step of crossing the inner membrane involves the sec apparatus. Types 1, 3, and 4 don't employ SEC, uh, and they form a contiguous conduit for secretion of protein from the cytoplasm to the extracellular environment. Type 1 systems are typified by the hemolysin secretion system from E. coli. Adding this functionality to E. coli requires three transport proteins, an ATP-binding ABC transporter, an adapter protein that bridges both the inner and outer membranes, and an outer membrane pore. Secretion of a protein through this apparatus doesn't involve any periplasmic intermediate. The protein is shuttled straight through the channel. The targeting signal is a short 20 amino acid peptide on the C terminus of the protein. If you'd like more detail, here is a reference that shows that the last 60 nucleotides of HLYA are a sufficient targeting signal to transport alkaline phosphatase to the extracellular environment. Type 3 secretion systems are native to many clades of bacteria and are usually associated with bacterium host interactions. In addition to directing proteins across the two inner membranes, type 3 systems usually have the ability to secrete proteins across a host cell's outer membrane. Those hosts include plant cells and mammalian cells, and different type 3 systems are specialized for the host cell's surface structure. The genes are usually encoded as clusters and contain around 20 proteins with extensive internal regulation. They are both evolutionarily and functionally related to flagella, and in fact flagella can be repurposed for type 3 secretion systems in E. coli. The signal sequence does not appear to map onto a primary sequence. Instead, it is a property of the three-dimensional structure of the secreted protein. However, you can often target another protein for secretion by fusion to a native effector that is normally secreted by the system. Like with type 1 secretion, there is no periplasmic intermediate. Type 5 secretion systems come in two types. Autotransporter proteins involve a single two-domain polypeptide. One of these domains is an outer membrane barrel protein and the other is a passenger protein. A well-studied example of this class is the AG43 protein in E. coli. If you'd like to learn more about this, I suggest you look that up. The process begins with sex secretion to the periplasm as an unfolded protein. It then spontaneously inserts itself into the outer membrane and pulls the passenger domain through to the cell surface. 
Some autotransporter proteins remain this way while others undergo cleavage of the passenger to the secreted state. Both proteases and spontaneous processes can cause cleavage of extracellular domains from the membrane-bound barrel. So sometimes autotransporters result in secretion and other times they result in display. Two partner secretion systems are very similar to autotransporters, but each is composed of two genes. Like the autotransporters, TPS systems involve dedicated secretion proteins for singular proteins, but they are genetically encoded as two proteins instead of a fusion protein. TPP transport results in secretion of the passenger protein. I don't have much to say about type, type 6 secretion. Microbiologists are still discovering new classes of transporters, and this is one of the newer ones. It involves a large cluster of proteins like type 3 secretion. Another process that occurs in prokaryotic cells is degradation. In eukaryotes, there is a large protein assembly called the degradosome that handles this recycling function, but it has far fewer components in prokaryotes and has a more utilitarian function in the cell. When a broken mRNA is translated, the ribosome will make protein until it reaches the end of the molecule, at which point it will become stalled holding onto both the mRNA and the nascent peptide. These stalled complexes are rescued by a molecule called tmRNA, which encodes a short peptide sequence and DNA-alpha. This sequence targets the protein for degradation. This mechanism can be used to direct a protein for proteolysis in the cell. A commonly used trick in synthetic biology is to, is to use GFP-LVA as a reporter gene for monitoring dynamic processes by microscopy. Proteins with this tag cycle in the cell instead of accumulating, allowing more faithful observation of these processes. I focused on compartments defined by lipid bilayers, but this is not the only type. Proteinaceous shells and aggregates of proteins similarly create local concentration effects and barriers to free diffusion of molecules in the cell. Compartmentalization strategies based on fusions to protein scaffolds, RNA scaffolds, and DNA scaffolds are being investigated as strategies to more efficiently direct flux through a biosynthetic pathway. Additional strategies include protein shells such as the carboxysome or virus particles. Okay, in this section, we're going to talk about <clears throat> the difference between facultative and obligate intracellular pathogens, talk about the three ways intracellular pathogens avoid destruction, describe different strategies that the pathogens use to avoid the immune system, and talk about how the intracellular pathogens can distinguish between intracellular and extracellular existence. So an intracellular pathogen, by definition, is one that has, is, is going to live inside the host cell, okay, do its dirty work within the confines of the plasma membrane in the cytoplasm, okay? So they're not detected by the immune system because they're hiding inside the host. <laughs> A facultative pathogen can invade the host but also live out in free space. Examples in include Salmonella, Shigella, and Listeria. Obligate intracellular pathogens invade and reproduce only inside the host cell examples include rickettsia and bartonella okay so let's take a look at intracellular pathogens a bacterial pathogen capable of hiding in a host cell initially enters by endocytosis the pathogen induces the host cell to take it up by phagocytosis and ends up in a phagosome these intracellular pathogens which live inside host cells as unwanted guests, gain temporary safe harbor because antibodies and phagocytic cells will not penetrate live host cells. Once inside the phagosome, intracellular pathogens have three options to avoid being killed by the fusion of the phagosome with a lysosome full of digestive enzymes. A single species can use only one of the three mechanisms. First, some pathogens can simply escape from the phagosome before fusion occurs. Pathogens such as Shigella and Listeria use this strategy and then enjoy unrestricted growth in the cytoplasm. They form actin tails that push them around the cell and even into adjacent cells, where they continue the infection. These microbes can spread from cell to cell without ever encountering the extracellular environment, where they would be vulnerable to attack. Alternatively, other pathogens such as Salmonella 
escape intracellular death by modifying the phagosomal membrane or other cytoplasmic components, preventing the fusion of the phagosome and lysosome. Salmonella enterica, cirovar typhi, the cause of typhoid fever, prevents phagolysosome fusion after it invades intestinal cells. Salmonella exits the intestinal cell and invades awaiting macrophages. Back in a phagosome, the bacterium reproduces, producing a large number of salmonella bacteria. The macrophage enters regional lymph nodes and infects other cells. From there, macrophages disseminate the bacteria through the circulatory system. A third way of escaping death inside a cell, performed by bacteria such as Coxiella, is simply to tolerate phagolysosome fusion. In this Grin and Barrett strategy, Coxiella bacteria reproduce in inclusion bodies in the acidic phagolysosome environment. Okay, some ways to avoid the immune system include capsules, which coat the bacterial cell wall and prevent the phagocyte from binding to it, cell surface proteins, which are components of the cell wall that can prevent detection, which can bind to the FC region on the antibody, that's the constant region, right? And that's the part that only changes when the antibodies switch class. And this can alter their antigens to avoid the antibody binding. Quorum sensing is used to communicate with other pathogens and determine population size within things like a biofilm, okay? And this also allows them, through these communication networks, to change their characteristics, right, to, um, to change what they secrete and what they display on their surface. So let's take a look at a model of bacterial pathogenesis with salmonella. Salmonella typhimurium, a small, rod-shaped bacteria which cause a gut infection well known as salmonella diarrhea. The infection starts by eating contaminated food or water. After ingestion, the bacteria travel through the alimentary system. Most of the bacteria are usually killed by the acidic conditions in our stomach. However, few bacteria may survive and are then transported to the intestine. The intestinal wall is made up mainly from epithelial cells, which form a protective barrier against microbial intruders in the gut. In the gut lumen, Salmonella has to compete with bacteria of the normal gut flora. Salmonella typhimurium uses its flagella to swim towards the surface of the epithelial cells which is covered with a vast number of small extensions, the microvilli, which increase the surface area for absorbing nutrients. Several factors on the salmonella surface help the bacteria to attach to the epithelial cells. These adhesins play an important role for the colonization and persistence of the bacteria in the intestinal lumen. Once Salmonella has attached to the surface, it now starts to invade into the interior of these cells. The bacteria use a specialized needle-like organelle, a type 3 secretion system, to deliver its toxins directly into the intestinal host cells. This system functions like a molecular syringe, which starts to inject the salmonella toxins as soon as it gets in contact with the host cell surface. Via this type 3 secretion system, salmonella typhimurium injects a whole cocktail of toxins, the effector proteins, SIP-A, SOP-E and SOP-E2, into the intestinal cell. Inside the host cell, the effectors interact with cellular proteins and lipids, and manipulate their function.
The injected salmonella effectors activate specific host proteins, which induce pronounced changes of the host cytoskeleton. As a result, the epithelial cell membrane extends outward. This ruffling process leads to the engulfment of the invading bacterium until it is taken up completely into the interior of the host cell. Now begins the intracellular lifestyle of Salmonella typhimurium inside the vacuole that has been formed during the engulfment of the bacterium by the host cell membrane. A different type 3 secretion apparatus is assembled and starts to inject a different set of salmonella effectors across the vacuolar membrane. Again, these effectors manipulate host functions. They alter the properties of the vacuole and trafficking processes in the host cell so that the bacterium is protected inside its vacuole from host defenses. Thin filaments start to extend from the vacuole covered with salmonella effectors, for example CIF A. Now the bacterium is safe and starts to replicate. Using type 3 secretion systems as molecular syringes to inject effectors into intestinal cells and manipulate signaling pathways, salmonella establishes an infection in the gut and triggers a profound inflammatory response leading to the typical symptoms of infection, abdominal pain and diarrhea. Much work is still needed to understand the different steps leading to disease. Okay, we'll talk about antigenic variation in rhinovirus and flu virus, and talk about HIV and how it targets T cells, and describe the role of NEF and TAT proteins in HIV pathogenesis, and outline human papillomavirus and how it affects cell division in the host, and talk about herpes simplex virus latency and how microRNAs impact it. So viruses, as you recall, are not living pathogens, okay? They are essentially gene delivery vehicles and target the host by attachment and an introduction of the genetic material and the core proteins and any associated enzymes into the host, okay? While the capsid proteins may or may not be part of the endosome, okay? Antigenic variation is just the ability to change the surface of the capsid in order to avoid the immune system. An example is the rhinovirus, which is the agent of the common cold. Each virus has unique capsids, and antibodies to one capsid may not be effective on another capsid. Okay? And again, these antigenic variations are brought about by mutation and natural selection. Antigenic shift is where two strains of flu virus can infect the same cell. The genomes can mix as a result, and this makes a virus that is significantly different from either of the two um, contributors. Okay, We could almost call them parents in a sense. And antigenic drift is just mutation that occurs within the cell that the virus infects, and that creates change in the viral proteins. Okay, so Again, um, you attack the host, you get inside, you um, cause the genetic material to begin the process of, um, depending on the virus type, um, transcription and translation, and during those processes, we end up generating mistakes in the messages, right, and that can create changes in the proteins that are produced, and as long as these changes don't affect capsid assembly, then it can be used to evade the immune system. And but keep in mind, right, that viruses don't have to carry genes that support their entire reproductive cycle. They only need to carry genes that um, 
are responsible for coding for the capsid and the core proteins and genes that will aid in the production of the genetic material in certain cases. Okay? HIV is an interesting case. It binds to CD4 receptor on T helper cells as well as chemokine receptor CCR5. Okay, so basically it knocks on the door of the host pretending to be something beneficial and it gets endocytosed. Okay? HIV is going to inhibit apoptosis in T cells and let the cell survive longer and make more virus. Okay? Now a couple things happen when this occurs. Okay? The T cell, which is critical to immune function, can no longer carry out its role in stimulating um, B cell activity and cytotoxic T cell activity. In addition, it causes the expression of proteins on its surface that induce apoptosis in cells that it comes into contact with. Okay, this is FAS and FAS ligand. Okay, so the helper T can can express FAS, and then when FAS hits FAS ligand, um, um, what will happen is that that will induce the target uh, to die. Okay, um, so the FAS would be on the target cell, and the FAS ligand would be on the helper T. Okay, I'll make sure I got that correct. Some examples of proteins that are going to impact the pathogenesis of HIV. Um, TAT, which is transcriptional transactivator, is going to speed up HIV transcription by host polymerase. It's also secreted from host and upon entering an uninfected cell can trigger apoptosis or program cell death. Okay. Viral protein R regulates import of HIV into the nucleus before viral cDNA integrates into the host. NEF or negative factor downregulates CD4 and MHC class 1 and protects the infected cell from killing by CD8 cytotoxic T's and also slows apoptosis in infected T's while secreted NEF activates apoptosis in uninfected lymphocytes. VIF counteracts a host cellular protein that naturally inhibits HIV replication and VPU counteracts a host cellular protein that inhibits virus assembly and export. Okay. An example of a test case, right? The patient, Janine, had not received a routine pap smear and she was sexually active. She noticed that she had small wart-like growths in her genital area but didn't seek treatment and was diagnosed with late-stage cervical cancer and tests that revealed human papillomavirus DNA. Okay, so how is it that human papillomavirus causes deregulation of the cell cycle in the host target? Well, let's take a look. Human papillomaviruses, also called HPVs, make up a group of over a hundred related viruses that infect people. Most HPVs can cause common skin warts, usually on the hands or feet. However, about 40 types of HPV infect the genitals, which are the sex organs on the outside of the body. These HPVs cause the most common sexually transmitted infections, illnesses transmitted from one person to another through sexual activity. Some genital HPVs are low risk and may only cause warts on and around the genitals and anus of both women and men. Rarely, these HPVs can also cause warts inside the mouth and throat. Other genital HPVs are high risk they can lead to cancer of the lower end of a woman's uterus, called the cervix. Less commonly, these HPVs can lead to other genital, anal, or oral cancers in both women and men. It's important to know that most HPV infections cause no symptoms, 
and the low-risk genital HPVs that cause warts are not an important cause of cancer. People infected with either a high-risk or a low-risk genital HPV spread it through skin-to-skin -skin contact during vaginal, anal, or oral sex. For infection to occur, HPV enters through tiny cuts in the skin around or inside the penis, vagina, throat, or anus. The virus makes its way down to the cells in the bottom or basal layer of skin and infects them. As the infected cells divide, the virus begins to make copies of itself. Eventually, the infected cells move up through the skin layers, releasing new viruses that can spread the infection to other cells. For most people, the cells of the immune system can destroy the infected cells, along with the virus, within two years. But, in some people, the immune system isn't able to destroy all of the viruses, leading to an infection that doesn't go away. HPV-infected cells may multiply over several weeks or months. If the cells are infected with low-risk HPV, they begin to form warts around the genitals. If the HPV is high-risk, it may damage the cell's genetic material, causing the cells to become precancerous. Over a period of years, a cancerous tumor may slowly form as the damaged cells continue to multiply. The most common cancer from high-risk genital HPV is cervical cancer. There is no cure for any type of HPV infection. However, the Gardasil vaccine can help protect against two of the most common high-risk HPVs that cause genital cancers. The vaccine also helps protect against two of the most common low-risk HPVs that cause genital warts. For best protection, preteen girls and boys should receive three doses of the vaccine over a period of six months before any sexual activity takes place. The vaccine injects dead proteins from HPV viruses into the bloodstream. These proteins don't cause infection. But the proteins do stimulate certain immune cells to create markers called antibodies that can identify these HPVs. Later, if the live versions of these viruses invade the skin, the antibodies recognize and attach to them. These immune cells destroy the marked viruses, which prevents an infection from happening. It is important to note that the vaccine does not protect against other types of HPV not included in the vaccine. The vaccine also doesn't reliably treat cells that are already infected. High-risk genital HPVs that cause cervical cancer are most treatable when diagnosed early. Women should have a pap test to see if their cervix has abnormal or precancerous cells, even if they've had an HPV vaccine. Check with a healthcare provider to find out how often to get this test. During this procedure, a healthcare provider will collect a small sample of cells from the cervix. These cells will be examined under a microscope to see if they're abnormal or cancerous. A separate HPV test will look for genetic material from high-risk types of HPV. When a pap test and HPV test are done together, it's called co-testing. If these tests show abnormal cells, a healthcare provider will recommend specific treatment based on the woman's age, medical history, and the abnormality of her cells. While there is no cure for an HPV infection, both abnormal and cancerous cells can be treated. Some types of HPV can cause common skin warts or genital warts. The warts may go away without treatment as the immune system fights off the HPV infection. If the warts are painful or don't go away, 
visit a health care provider so they can examine the warts to determine the best way to remove them. Although you can treat common warts at home, do not treat genital warts yourself. Procedures to remove either common warts or genital warts include freezing with cryotherapy, burning with an electric current called electrocautery, or by surgical removal. For more information, talk to a healthcare professional. Okay. Herpes simplex virus, HSV, okay? After a primary infection, herpes virus can become latent in the host and live inside nerve cells or inside white blood cells and as a result avoid detection by the immune system. The DNA circularizes and exists as an episome in the nucleus and the DNA can also integrate into the host genome. And this is latency, okay? Latent virus can re-emerge after years of latency and cause new active infections. Small RNA molecules called microRNAs made by herpes virus interfere with the host cell's apoptosis program and so that keeps the cell active and keeps it producing the herpes virus. Okay, um, This is similar to what um, the uh, to what herpes zoster does. Okay, herpes zoster likes to live in the dorsal root ganglia of the nervous system, which is going to be along your back. Okay, these are the nerve fibers that bring sensory information into the central nervous system, and they're kept in check as a result of immune activity. Um, as virus particles emerge over time, the immune system can intercept and destroy them if they're in small number. But what can happen late in life is that the um, the herpes zoster can reactivate and go into lytic mode and produce massive numbers of virus particles that emerge from the nerve endings and cause the characteristic eruptions on the skin that we associate with a disease called shingles. Okay. And this happens for a host of reasons, one of which is the fact that the immune system becomes less capable of keeping the virus in check through normal B cell and T cell function as we get older. Okay? And this is one of the reasons that we promote a, um, a shingles vaccine for individuals um, around the age of 65 or older, okay? to remind the immune system that you have this permanent, obligate, intracellular pathogen living in your body for the rest of your life. Okay. In this section, we'll describe how protozoans invade hosts and correlate the immune response to protozoan-induced damage and in host tissue, and talk about mechanisms that they use to avoid the immune system. So, antigenic masking is utilized by protozoans to coat themselves in host to avoid detection by the immune system. This is similar to what um, secreted viruses can sometimes do when they take um, membrane from the host cell as a cloak to avoid detection by the immune system. Okay, that's why we call some viruses enveloped and some viruses not. Okay, it's basically a disguise. Antigenic variation is just another way, again, to change the appearance of the antigens on the surface, okay? Um, the result is that the immune system has to now regenerate a novel primary response to these fresh antigens in order to um, knock them back, okay? So we have the, uh, the beginning of the cycle of infection where the trypanosome um, enters with one set of antigens exposed, okay. Eventually, what will happen is that um, an antigenic shift will strip off that layer and expose a different layer on the trypanosome. And now um, we're going to have a different appearance on the outer surface 
that we'll have to generate new antibodies to in order to attack. Okay? And so basically what's happening is that the immune system is selecting for those trypanosomes that are vulnerable and leaving behind the ones that have already done the, uh, the antigenic shift. Okay? Intracellular locations of certain pathogens um, can allow it to avoid the immune system. Some protozoans are going to secrete anti-inflammatory cytokines um, to reduce the immune response uh, causing their attack. An example here right, is the uh, trypanosome that causes sleeping sickness. Okay, Again, this is a eukaryotic pathogen and essentially what it's doing is it's tamping down um, the inflammatory process which is designed to bring blood to the area and with the blood come the white blood cells and with the white blood cells come the ability to destroy the pathogen okay so basically it's disarming the um, the ability of cells in the area to warn the immune system that an infection has taken place okay so you can think of the the cytokines is kind of a, a smoke signal or a flare that starts the process of inflammation and attracts the white blood cells to the region of the infection. Okay. All right. Um, the uh, animations are shown here, um, and I will add on to this um, on the back end. A little bit about uh, trypanosomes and how they do their work okay so that you can see a little bit more um, insight into um, eukaryotic protozoal pathogenesis okay so that'll follow the last slide in this series okay and I will see everybody um, in the next podcast and I thank you for listening the sleeping sickness cycle starts with a bite from a tetsi fly. If the fly bites someone who's already sick, it ingests parasites as well as blood. These parasites, called trypanosomes, accumulate in the fly's gut. Twenty days later, they migrate to the tetsi fly's salivary glands and are ready to infect another victim when the fly next bites. The parasite enters the lymphatic system and then passes into the bloodstream and circulates through the body. At first, the host's immune defenses attack the parasite. To shield themselves, the parasites mutate, change form, and escape from the host's immune system, until they're recognized and attacked by another wave of antibodies. This cycle of attack and defense is repeated several times. It's accompanied by symptoms such as intermittent fever, headaches, and joint pain. Symptoms that mirror the inner struggle between the immune cells and the parasites. These first phase symptoms are sometimes too mild to be detected, but this is when it is actually easiest to treat the disease. If it isn't treated in time, the parasites advance to the brain. The blood-brain barrier is there, a filter to protect the brain against pathogens, toxins, and hormones circulating in the blood. But the trypanosomes breach it. At this stage, the disease is much more difficult to treat, as the blood-brain barrier also blocks some drug molecules.
If the trypanosomes manage to enter into the brain, the sleep pattern becomes erratic. Infected people develop poor coordination and become confused, alternating between episodes of severe fatigue and agitation. Sleeping during the day, they can't sleep at night. The deterioration of the nervous system leads to coma. Left untreated, sleeping sickness is fatal. Welcome to MedicoFem YouTube channel. Trypanosoma cruzi passes its life cycle in two hosts. One human. Two vector reduviate bugs, also known as kissing bugs. This video shows the life cycle of Trypanosoma cruzi in human host. Metacyclic trypomastigote form is infective to human, that is found in feces of insect reduviate bug. Reduviate bugs are nocturnal in habitat. Human gets infection while insect bite by reduviate bug, that is infected with Trypanosoma cruzi. Along with biting and blood meal, metacyclic trypomastigote form present in feces are deposited on human skin. Metacyclic trypomastigote form gets entry into blood, when abraded skin, mucous membranes, or conjunctivi become contaminated with reduviate bug's feces containing infective form of the parasite. T. cruzi can also be transmitted by laboratory accidents, blood transfusion, organ transplantation, vertical transmission from mother to child and rarely by contaminated food or drinks. After entry into the blood, the parasite invades reticuloendothelial cells, macrophage, and tissues like muscles, epithelial cells, nervous tissues, Inside macrophage, there is formation of parasitophorous vacuole. These parasitophorous vacuole fuses with lysosomes. Inside vacuole it transforms into a mastigote form followed by rupture of vacuole and release of a mastigote in cell cytosol. A mastigote multiply by binary fission forming a cyst-like mass of growth known as pseudocyst. Many amastigotes within pseudocyst are transformed into modal non-multiplying trypomastigote forms. On rupture of the pseudocyst, Trypomastigotes are liberated to blood. Liberated trypomastigotes are of two types. One slender highly modal forms. Two broader less modal forms. Slender highly modal have elongated nucleus, subterminal kinetoplast and short free flagellum. They are invasive form and migrate to many organs, penetrate cells, and continue the life cycle. Broader less modal have oval nucleus, terminal kinetoplast and long free flagellum. They persist in blood and are taken up by insect vector during blood meal. Further development occurs in vector reduviate bugs. Thanks for watching this video. If you like this video, then please share this video. For more such videos, please subscribe to our channel.